So our stock's going to just keep going higher after last week's surge. And is the U.S. dollar going to keep going lower after it got taken to the woodshed? That's the question we are asking ourselves here. Welcome to Macro Money. This is Ilya Spivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. As ever, if you are watching this on YouTube, jump in the comments, share your thoughts, and we will incorporate them into the show. But therein is the question that we find ourselves facing. Are we going to have more of the same? Because, of course, last week we had a really action-packed week, lots and lots of event risk, lots and lots of things to digest. And, boy, the markets did not disappoint uh, when uh, it came to how action-packed the price action ultimately ended up being the S&P 500, uh, just to kind of give us a benchmark, rose 5.76% last week. That's the biggest rise since June of 2022. The dollar got absolutely smashed. It went down 2%, which was the worst weekly performance in four months. All of this uh, around mainly the idea that the Fed is uh, done raising rates here, confirmed by the FOMC with a wink and a nudge, um, obligatory though those are. And uh, likewise, uh, the sort of working out of the geopolitical risk premium out of markets. Um, very tellingly, gold did not accelerate higher last week, despite um, the situation between Israel and Hamas only escalating. Uh, the price of crude oil did not go higher. As a matter of fact, it went uh, lower instead. Uh, all of that suggesting that the markets, as with the Ukraine war, uh, after the initial shock have kind of benchmarked what is going on here, they've priced that in, and they've said, okay, well, as long as no new combatants enter the fray here to fundamentally alter the landscape, this isn't anything that we need to worry about. Let's focus on the Fed and the prospect that money isn't going to keep getting more expensive, but instead that stimulus might be on the horizon. And so the question for this week then is, is it smooth sailing? And the answer is, well, maybe. Uh, but we are not without a bit of event risk to consider where things might get a little bit dicey in particular because the moves were of course so large and so it's possible that markets might be in a kind of digestive state where we don't necessarily get aggressive follow-through just because we uh, don't necessarily have anything changing we've come a long way and so there's maybe some tactical uh, position management, some tactical portfolio re rebalancing now that we've had those big moves. So maybe we don't go very far. So what we're going to do here is see what does stand up, the top three catalysts here that stand up, to uh, give us some macro impetus for markets and see what they're likely to do and why. And we begin with a conversation about Australia. So here we have another central bank getting ready to make its policy announcement. And it gets interesting here because, of course, over recent weeks, we've heard from the ECB, uh, the European Central Bank. We've heard from the Bank of England. We've heard from the Fed. All of them basically giving us a obligatory scripted, we want to beat inflation, but kind of uh, kind of a guidance saying, yes, we want to beat inflation. Yes, we still have more fighting to do, but we already have so much tightening that's still in the pipeline. It takes months and months, over a year, for a single rate hike to be fully absorbed into the economy. It is still very much absorbing what we did last year and in the first half of this year. Let's back up here. The global economy looks like it's very much on the cusp of a recession. And now it looks like everybody uh, is basically going to walk into this recession holding hands uh, all at the same time. So the question increasingly for markets seem to become, as incidentally we anticipated here on macro money, who will have stimulus first? And the markets will start to reward that, to basically say, 
we are not so much looking for where there are more hikes or where economic conditions are better because there aren't any more hikes, it looks like, and economic conditions aren't better anywhere at this point. The U.S. was, of course, the standout, but now looks increasingly like it's going to catch up downward with everybody else. But instead, where are conditions so bad, so dire, that we've seen the critical mass of bad news? Stimulus will come soonest. This is where risk appetite wants to go because this is where the healing salve will be dispensed most promptly. So with that in mind, we look at the RBA here, which is yet another major G10 central bank in this narrative. The expectation that uh, that the markets are baking in here as we get ready for the RBA in just uh, a matter of hours here is that there's about a 53, 54% chance that they're going to hike rates again at this meeting. There's a further 23% chance that they're going to hike at the next meeting and skip this one for a cumulative 77% between one and the second. And then the hike is fully priced in by February of next year, which is the first meeting for the RBA in 2024. There's about a 32% chance that it happens then. So the markets are kind of leaning in the direction of it happens now or it happens in February. But by February, we get one more hike. And after that, that's it. At that point, we are done. Things get a little bit interesting thereafter because rate cuts are not terribly close at hand. So we can see that even into the end of next year, the likelihood that we get any kind of cutting, even episodic with individual meetings, 18% for November, 20% for December. So the markets essentially think the RBA does one more hike and then stops at least through the rest of next year. If we look at what is expected to occur here, uh, looking at the policy curve that's implied here, we can see the markets don't expect a very significant easing cycle. Uh, they expect it to begin a full year from now. You can see the peak in rates there at four and a half. So if we're at 4.1 now, the markets kind of guesstimate that we're going to get another hike to 4.35, 4.36 within about three months. So again, by February. That's what we're seeing here. You can see there's a small 10 basis point drift here, but not a full 25 basis point hike. So the markets see rates kind of inching up without there being any actual tightening. So just kind of overshooting a little. Then going into 2025, there's an easing cycle that brings us back to where we are currently. So down by about a, um, a 25 basis point cut. And then within three years, we idle. So monetary policy in Australia is seen basically kind of tinkering around the edges. What's interesting here is that compared with the last RBA meeting at the beginning of last month, the curve has become more hawkish. So it's shifted. You can see the big dashes there. That's where we, we were on the 3rd of October when the RBA last met. The curve has since shifted up. But it has likewise shifted down relative to a week ago. So the, the markets have kind of tempered their enthusiasm here. This is where this gets interesting, because Australia is a tremendously important part of the global business cycle. It is a major commodity producer, a major shipper of some of the biggest, most important, most traded commodities, and by far the number one supplier of those commodities to China, the world's second largest economy, and the biggest consumer of raw material inputs. So as a barometer on where we are in the global business cycle, Australia is hugely significant. And so Looking at this then and what the RBA ends up saying, what they see as the way forward here should be very, very interesting for not only what we think about Australian assets, but what we think about the global economy as a whole and the whole universe of assets that's attached into that story. Now, 
The possibility here seems to be that the RBA might actually hold fire because the inputs don't seem to warrant a tremendous amount of tightening. And then we'll have to see if they actually take those cues. So the upshift in the curve relative to the last policy announcement seemed to mainly follow from there being a slight upside surprise on quarterly inflation data. So you can see here the last CPI number, Australia releases a monthly and a quarterly. The monthly is kind of new and doesn't um, command nearly as much attention as the quarterly, perhaps because the RBA doesn't really take the monthly into account and have said so. The quarterly somewhat um, somewhat overshot, so 5.4% versus 53 And the market's got a little bit hopped up on that, uh, and so that's why uh, it seems we have this shift from the big dashed curve to the currently solid one. But if we look at the dynamics, Inflation expectations, uh, as reflected in the swaps market, which tends to be a better uh, indicator for Australia, there seems to be a very orderly process that's underway. So we have expectations peaking both at the one-year and the two-year uh, tanner here, and then starting to come down. We can see they lead inflation by about two quarters. And so in that they continue to decline here seems to suggest that headline CPI will continue to move lower uh, and give the RBA every reason to back up and see what happens going forward rather than get too activist. A similar indication comes from the housing market. Housing is a tremendously outsized portion of Australia's economy, uh, particularly when it comes to consumer sentiment and consumer prices. Uh, obviously, the economy is mainly driven by mining in the banking sector when we talk about economy-wide, but for consumers, housing is an outsized portion of CPI. And here we can see, just taking Sydney and Melbourne um, average uh, home prices and looking at those year on year and comparing them to CPI year on year, we seem to have this sense that uh, the the price of housing in the main metro centers in Australia leads CPI by about two quarters again. And if that's going to continue, then looking at what housing prices have been doing seems to suggest that CPI is on track to continue declining. At the same time, the performance of Australia's economy has been, once again, woeful. So after a brief pop, in um, the composite PMI above 50, which is the sort of center line for PMIs, above 50 is growth, below 50 is contraction. The further you go above 50, the faster the growth. The further you go below 50, the faster the contraction. What we see here is a situation where there was a brief pop after two months of contraction. That's the yellow bars uh, there showing the composite index, so both manufacturing and services together. Those two months followed a slight pop in September. That pop has now given way, and uh, the economy is actually at this point shrinking at the fastest rate yet this year. That's happened because after a pop in services, the thing fizzled. And so at this point, services are back down into shrinking territory. So from the RBA's perspective, it doesn't seem like there's a reason to rush. They will almost certainly come out and give us all of the familiar talking points that we've now heard from all the major central banks, but it doesn't look like there is a sense of imminent inflationary doom here, that the urgency, it just isn't there to keep tightening. So this is where it gets interesting. If the story out of the RBA here is no hike, and maybe we're done, maybe it's not quite so uh, obvious that we're still going to get a hike somewhere next year, but instead, maybe the likelihood of that comes down and maybe the cuts come in closer into next year as opposed to the start of 2025, that could comport with what we're seeing if, for the ECB, for the Bank of England, for the US. Where this gets really interesting is the examples from the ECB and the BOE in particular were dovish central banks lifting the local currency. 
And that doesn't seem to speak to that currency gaining more yield advantage. Obviously, that's the opposite of what's occurred. However, with all the central banks seemingly opting to stop at about the same time, yield spreads are getting locked in. And so the next question becomes, well, who's going to have stimulus first? That's where the economy is going to rebound first. So capital, as we talked about last week and as we saw in spades in the price action, rotates from U.S. dollar-denominated assets, which had been outperforming, into assets denominated in other currencies. So if the RBA here throws in the towel and says, we're closer to easing than you thought, the upshot might well be, okay, so there's a reason to buy Australian assets because maybe they're now on discount. And if that's the case, then perhaps we are in a situation where the Aussie dollar goes up, not so much in spite of a dovish RPA, but because of it, which is counterintuitive, but nevertheless, that's what we've been seeing and that's what could occur. So local stocks would, of course, get a lift as well. And we'll see if there's any follow through to broader global equity sentiment. The next bit to contend with comes out of China. Here, we're supposed to get import and export numbers. They're both uh, seen having negative handles on them again, down 3.5% on exports, down 5% on imports, which again speaks to the, just the terribly anemic conditions in China since the reopening that wasn't. Everybody was very optimistic about China's um, emergence from COVID lockdowns in um, December of 2022, thinking, oh, the world's largest economy is going to come and save everybody. Well, not so much. They never really got off the ground. Uh, and we've talked at length about why um, in, in prior shows. I encourage you to check those out. Uh, readily available uh, on the Tasty Live YouTube uh, channel. Uh, and uh, just search for macro money there or see the playlist. Um, we've gone over the many... Uh, the many perils of what's going on in China several times. But the upshot here is that things are getting a little bit less bad. So we can see here the negative numbers are getting smaller. It's a similar story when we look at the other big release this week out of China, the inflation numbers. Here, PPI looks like it's going to idle, give or take. CPI looks like it's going to edge a little bit lower again, maybe print negative. And again, all of this speaks to anemic demand. Why do prices fall? When there's lots of demand, limited uh, goods are being chased by everyone at the same time. So lots of money uh, chasing a uh, scarce amount of goods. So you get inflation. People compete on price, the price of things goes up. If demand is weak, you get the opposite. Things go on discount. People need to encourage buying of things, so they cut their prices. That's very much what we've been seeing in China. As a matter of fact, for the second consecutive quarter now, we have had real GDP overstate or um, uh, overpower nominal GDP in China, which essentially means that, that nominal GDP, which is GDP including the impact of inflation, is weaker than real GDP, which is nominal minus that inflation, which tells you that that, inf that inflation is likely negative. So if real GDP is above nominal, it, te it, it tells you inflation is not inflation, but deflation, more likely. And the gap at this point is eye-wateringly high, 1.4%. It was one5 percent in the second quarter. You can see those those two negative bars there. So demand is virtually gone. However, markets are forward looking. And the upshot here is that things aren't necessarily getting worse. They're not getting better. They're not getting good, but they're not getting worse. And from that perspective, the markets have ostensibly discounted what needs to be discounted already, as long as the data doesn't surprise the wrong way. And looking at economic uh, data outcomes uh, from Citigroup's analysis, 
relative to forecasts, it seems that not only is Chinese economic data improving relative to forecasts, meaning since the middle of July or so, it started to undershoot by less of a margin, as of more recent times, let's call it the past a few weeks or so, it's actually moved to where it's tending to outperform forecasts. So it's moved above zero here, where outcomes are now tending to overshoot forecasts, as opposed to just undershoot them by a smaller amount. And so, ostensibly, there has been already more negativity in the price than reality has endorsed. And that's the price of, you name it, Chinese assets. So, with that in mind, these numbers don't need to give us anything good. They just need to give us something that isn't worse. And from there, bargain hunting might ensue. What we see from um, the way that markets have performed in the U.S. versus China this year so far, the CSI 300, which is sort of China's version of the S&P 500, a big catch-all index, that's down almost 11%. The iShares China large cap ETF, FXI, that's down 10.1%. Compare that with the way U.S. stocks have performed, S&P 500, including the Magnificent Seven, quote, unquote, so including tech, up 14%. S&P 500 excluding tech is down 2%, so we know who's been driving this rally. But... Nevertheless, down 2% is a whole lot better than down 10 or 11. So if the stock of bad news in China has perhaps run out, then maybe there are, uh, there's an opportunity for some bargain hunting here that the markets perceive. And we start to see a bit more nibbling near the lows around things like ASHR, FXI, these are, of course, China tracking ETFs, which is what you see here, uh, but also the Aussie dollar, uh, as we just said, it is, in many ways, a proxy for what's going on in China because it is very much exposed to China's business cycle. And then finally, there's a pair of speeches from Fed Chair Jerome Powell this week. The first one is an intro to a Fed conference, which is unlikely to stir the animal spirits one way or another very, um, very much here. But the second on Thursday is an appearance at the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and he's going to be on a panel talking about the challenges of policy in the current economic environment. So right on the nose with what markets want to hear, or at least the kind of information that markets want to hear. And the question here will be, can he do no harm, as it were? Markets were cheering last week. They applauded the Fed for signaling that maybe they're done. They moved up the timing for the first cut from July to June. Now it's fully baked in for June. Um, we can see here uh, the first cut right there. The probability of any further tightening fell away, just a meager cumulative 18% by January. And then we go into cutting mode slightly better than even odds of a cut in May, but the real important bit here in June. And then here we can see, whereas we were kind of saying maybe two cuts leaning to three before the FOMC last week, now we're saying three over the course of next year with a meaningful 42% probability for a fourth. So that's a full one percentage point off rates if that occurs. And then we're real close to fully pricing it in by January, 91% chance that we get that fourth cut by January of 2025. So the market's very much expecting a more dovish Fed this go-round um, after the latest FOMC than before it. And you can see that in the shifting of the curve. So, of course, the FOMC was just last week. So the difference between the current curve and the uh, FOMC curve uh, from the 1st of November are is, is minuscule. But a week before today, we were looking at a more hawkish Fed curve. You can see that right here. So over the course of a week, we shifted from this more steep curve to this shallower one. 
So what we're looking at now is a situation where the Fed speaking circuit, there's a ton of Fed speakers this week, but of course Powell is front and center, really just has to not upset the apple cart. They need to say nothing that is going to meaningfully alter the equation, and as long as that is what they manage to do, we don't necessarily uh, have any reason to go in the opposite direction of where we've gone. And we can see what that's looked like. So from July, we can see rate cut expectations for where we're going to be in the 12 months between December of this year and the end of next have been reduced. So here we're looking at about uh, almost 2%, 1.75% in cuts over this period. So between this upcoming Fed meeting next month and the end of next year. And we can see that as worries about the banking crisis receded, as worries about the debt ceiling receded, those cuts started to fall away. And as the prospect of higher interest rates filtered into markets, the S&P took notice and said, oh, it's going to be more expensive to finance earnings. We need to bring the price down. So as we've seen these cuts evaporate out of the outlook, stocks have come down. Notice what happens when more cuts enter into the fray. Every single time that more cuts happen, almost every time, we get a bit of a lift. So it starts to happen here. So here, a little bit more uh, of a cut profile, stocks go up. Then they start to get reduced again, stocks come down. The September uh, 20th FOMC is right around here. Again, you start to get a little bit more of a cut possibility in this period, slightly deeper cuts, stocks go up. Once they start to get hemmed in again, stocks come back down. And then most recently, we start to really build in more cuts as the Fed does its dovish pivot last week. There's last week here. You can see against the backdrop of this, you can see this is now the most cuts priced in that we've seen since back in August, September. Against that backdrop, stocks have surged. Now, the question then becomes, can Powell say things that are vague enough, nonspecific enough, not to upset this? And if he does, if he manages to do that, is there any reason why stocks shouldn't keep going higher? Is that not the, the path of least resistance at this point? And it would seem that it is. So... We're going to be watching this speech very closely because this is where things get really murky. Not only do we have the uncertainty of what Powell is going to say, but also the uncertainty of how markets are going to read it. And if it seems like the message is, right, you heard us correctly last week, we're done, we're not talking about cuts, Fed wouldn't admit that at the moment to keep inflation expectations anchored, and maybe they're earnestly not talking about cuts, certainly not in a formal way. But for the moment, all the markets really need to know is that they feel themselves finished and firmly anchored in wait and see mode. As long as that happens, stocks may continue to go higher. If instead the markets pick up on something that uh, Powell says that feels a little bit more hawkish than they'd like, stocks may correct a bit lower as you get more of a pull in into this direction on rate cut expectations. It's a similar story for the US dollar, where you can see it had been going up as rate cut expectations were diminishing. Of course, that makes sense. That gives the dollar more of an attractive yield profile relative to other currencies. And so as you get fewer cuts, you get higher rates than you initially thought you were going to have. And so the borrowing of dollars is now going to be more expensive in your mind, but also the lending of dollars is going to be more lucrative. So it starts to make more sense to own more dollars. So as you get reduction in rate cut potential, the dollar goes up. Notice again here, more rate cuts, lower dollar. Less rate cuts, higher dollar. 
once again, we have started to build more rate cuts as of last week into the system, and so the dollar has taken a sharp leg lower. It's the same logic here. If the Fed doesn't upset the apple cart, then maybe there is a degree of natural follow-through to this dynamic as people keep pricing it in. But if the Fed gives a sense that maybe we um, are overstepping here in markets, that maybe they didn't quite mean so much dovishness last week that the markets um, interpreted, then you could see the dollar find a slight bit of a reprieve, at least temporarily. And that is macro money for today. As ever, we are here every Monday through Thursday, right after overtime, a show that I co-host with Chris Vecchio and Dylan Radigan, where we look at what happened in markets, geopolitics, economics, and whatever else over the course of uh, the day, and try to make sense of it and where markets might go thereafter. I'm back on with Chris on Fridays for Futures Power Hour, on with Tom and Tony for First Call on Sundays, writing for the News and Insights section of TastyLive.com. As a matter of fact, a summary of this very analysis is there currently. And opining on the platform formerly known as Twitter, at Elias Pivak. Thanks very much for joining. Macromani will be back tomorrow. Hop into those YouTube comments and share your thoughts. Just keep it cordial. It's very spicy out there in the comment sections of the world today. And Macro Money will be back tomorrow. Take care.